Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and being instructed, for understanding insightful sayings, for receiving wise instruction in righteousness, justice and integrity, for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man, A wise man will listen and increase his learning and a discerning man will obtain guidance. For understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the word of the Lord. As you open your newsletters, you'll see an outline there. On the left-hand side, there is a folded A4 sheet. We'll come to that towards the end, and God willing, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. But I want to begin with the question that I asked the kids. What will I need for the year ahead? Uh, it's not necessarily the question we ask first, is it, as we approach a new year? Uh, often we ask, what will I want to achieve? What will I want to get rid of out of my life? What will I resolve to do? But I I want us to ask this question first. What will I need for the year ahead? Uh, It sounds a little back to front, but if you start back to front, you might actually end up with better answers at the end. Because if you work out what you need, then you'll shape what you'll be aiming for. Then you'll understand what you will seek, and then you'll work out what you want to achieve. Uh, It's an ideal question to ask at such a time. Now, what we're going to do today is not rocket science. And let me tell you, it is not original. Uh, At every point at this time of the year, many of us will take a moment to reflect, won't we? Uh, Just to see, and even if we don't want to reflect, whatever we're reading, whatever is being thrown in front of us, will cause us to pause and think about the year that we've had, the one we've made it through, and the year that's coming. And often that moment of reflection gives birth to resolutions, Decisions about things to be changed, things to be achieved, added or removed. But I want us to start a little more deeper than that and ask, what do I actually need for the year ahead? Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you for its goodness. I thank you for its clarity. Father, forgive our sin, which often clouds your word or gives us stubborn hearts and stubborn minds to refuse it. Father, by your spirit... Please help us to understand what we need for the year ahead and help us to apply it to our lives by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. For gaining wisdom and being instructed, for understanding insightful sayings, for receiving wise instruction in righteousness, justice and integrity, for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man. A wise man will listen and increase his learning and a discerning man will obtain guidance. For understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and their riddles. As you finish 2023 and begin 2024, are you someone who wants to make sense of life? Who wants to work out why things tick? Why do people invade? Why do people go to war? Why are people so generous? Why are people so stingy? How am I going to navigate life? Are you someone like that? Are you someone who desires to know the right way to do things? Are you someone who desires a world that is just and fair? Are you someone who would love relationships to be honest and transparent and truthful and for things to be in the open? As one year ends and another year begins, are you someone who knows you lack experience to deal with the world and everything that it throws at you? Are you someone who's desiring to know when to speak and when not to speak? Are you someone who desires to know and learn more and more and more? Are you you someone who desperately knows they need some guidance, some help in making sense of the world? That's the person described in verses 2 to 6, isn't it? And as we finish one year and start the next, let me tell you there is much that puzzles, bewilders and confuses about the world we live in. From making sense of the violence of the Middle East and why the war in Ukraine is moving into its third year, 
to understanding how to navigate the politics of junior sport on a Saturday, through to the art of conversation and how to make friends, into the decision about how to move house, how to change a job, how to choose an educational option, how to do marriage, how to even do parenting, as you seek to navigate loneliness, and changes in your living situation, even down to how you will spend some quality time with your family in rest and leisure. All of those bewilder and puzzle and confuse, don't they? And they're all part of navigating a broken world. God understands that. We mightn't. In fact, all that I've said, you might be, actually, that's not me at all, Bernard. But God understands that we are like this if we sit and we pause. And so he issues an invitation. Just look back there at the first verse. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Why are these here? Well, do you notice how all the sections begin? For gaining this, for gaining this, for gaining this, for getting this, for getting this. God's issuing an invitation. Come and read and listen so that you will receive what you need for the year ahead and for life. Not just in these Proverbs, but as we'll find out, in the whole of God's Word. And then we're actually told the guts of it. I'm at point three on the outline, down there in verse seven. The Proverbs of Solomon, for getting all this, here's the summary, verse seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. What do we need? We need knowledge. Or as you notice there in parallel, we need wisdom. I gave a bit of a definition of wisdom to the kids. Uh, Let's expand it a little. Uh, Wisdom is understanding and explaining the world rightly and then living in line with it. Understanding and explaining the world rightly and then living in line with it. Well, how are we going to get it? Well, Solomon makes clear it has a starting point. Did you notice that there in verse 7? It begins, and it begins where? It begins with the fear of the Lord. Now, what's that? Uh, we, we use that phrase often. We're familiar with it. And we often tie it with emotions, don't we? Uh, for some of us, it provokes knee shaking. For others, there's a cold feeling in your guts. For some of us, it's reverence and awe. They all play an understanding in that crucial phrase. But I think the best place to understand it is in another part of God's word. Uh, I want to take us to a poem. Uh, Psalm 19. If you've got your Bibles there, page 480. But I'm going to have it on the overhead. So I just got you turning and now you can look at the overhead. It's much easier. Uh, Psalm 19 is a poem that many of us are familiar with. Uh, It's a poem that we've used time and time again as we've spent time in church together. And the more and more I look at it, the more and more I think it's got to do with wisdom. Uh, The first six verses, and not all of them are there, that's just verses 1 to 4, In the first six verses, creation is observed. And in all of creation, we see, notice there, the glory of God and the work of his hands. There's a big bloke out there who made stuff. That's what creation say. There's a big bloke out there who made stuff. But notice there, they don't speak. Creation utters no words. It gives us colours. It stimulates our senses. Uh, It gives us experiences, but it doesn't speak. In order to know God as Lord, and there's a crucial change in verse 7 with the name of God from God to Lord, in order to know God as Lord, the God who's covenantally committed to his world, who's made promises that he will always keep, we need more than sunrises and gum leaves. We actually need God's words. We need the words of God. That's familiar to us, isn't it? Because that's how our relationships work. We can know something about someone by the stuff they do and how they look, but we'll actually only ever know someone when we get their words. And then the two go together, the practice and the proclamation. And so in the next few verses, in verses 7 to 9, we get the words of the Lord, and notice we've got a different name for God here. Not God, the big bloke out there, but Lord the bloke who's made promises, who's committed to you, the instruction of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the ordinances of the Lord. 
And all of those descriptions of God are about his words. And those words do things, don't they? Those words revive your soul. They make the inexperienced wise. They make your heart glad. They make the eyes light up. They show you what is trustworthy and true. Sounds remarkably like Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. And it's confirmed by the one phrase I didn't read. Did you notice that? Did you notice amongst all those words about words, there's a word that's got nothing to do with words? The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. That sounds a lot more like Proverbs 1, 7, doesn't it? And the bloke who wrote this poem wants us to step back and notice in parallel that the fear of the Lord is connected with the words of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is connected with the words of the Lord. Whatever else the fear of the Lord is, and it is all those other deep emotions, they're appropriate and wise, whatever else the fear of the Lord is, it is inseparable from the word of the Lord. They are connected. In fact, I think the fear of the Lord will only ever come about when we rightly understand the words of the Lord. When we rightly understand who God is and who we are. And, and that's why it keeps going further. They're more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey, than honey dripping from the comb. In addition, your servant is warned by them and there is great reward in keeping them. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule over me. Then I'll be innocent, cleansed from blatant rebellion. The words of the Lord are precious above everything else because they help us understand who we are in front of who God is. Do you see how they did that? Do you see how they're more precious because they provide us with warning and insight into who we are? We're reminded that we're sinners, that we live in constant rebellion against God, even though we sometimes don't even know we're rebelling, even when it's not blatant and obvious. It helps us remember that we're in desperate need of help in this life. We tried being God and it really didn't work out that great. And we need help from trying to be God. We need help from God the one we rebelled against. Such a realisation should lead to fear, shouldn't it? And it will only come about from God's word, an awesome realisation of who we are by nature before God. And it will only emerge as we read the words of the Lord, where we're brought face to face with God, face to face with the one we sin against, but who's committed to deal with our sin, which brings us to the last word, verse. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We, we can only say that because of that last word. Because God has spoken, we know who we are, we know who he is, we turn back to him, knowing that he alone is the one who can deal with us. He alone is the one who can make sense of who we are, and the world that we have broken around us. What's the fear of the Lord? It's the right understanding of who we are before who God is, by reading and understanding God's word alone. The fear of the Lord is inseparable from the word of the Lord. The fear of the Lord enables us to understand the world we live in and live in it rightly. Uh, that desire expressed there, and then in Proverbs 1, 7, reaches a climax at some point in the Bible, doesn't it? Where, where does that word and fear connection reach its climax? Well, if you take the chance today and you open John's biography of Jesus, how's Jesus described there in chapter 1, verses 1 to 18? He's described as the word, the only one who has ever seen God and now reveals God. In Jesus Christ... We come face to face with God's word in the flesh, face to face with God as he is. And that's why we had that other reading from Ros. As God's mob, because of what God has revealed in his word, what God has spoken and written and then in the flesh, we've come to know this, Jesus Christ for us is wisdom from God. He brings us face to face with God. 
He brings us face to face with our own nature. He brings us into forgiveness. In him we have all we need for the year ahead and for life eternity. And then we're given all of his acceptability because God has brought it about. In the year ahead, we'll need wisdom. Wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is inseparable from the word of the Lord, God's revelation. That revelation reaches its climax in Jesus Christ alone. And in the word of the Lord, we have all we need for the year ahead. So where do we get it? Well, again, it's as simple as what the kids heard. We, we open the Bible and we read it. There is God's word spoken, written, and in the flesh. Uh, if You could do a lot worse than just open the book of Proverbs and start reading, except that invitation. But let's go back to Proverbs page 554, and let's look at something really interesting about how it says we access this wisdom. Page 554, look at verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. D did you notice where you get wisdom in verse 1? You get wisdom across generations, from older to younger in a community. David had a boy. That boy's name was Solomon. Solomon looked at the world and by the grace of God spoke and wrote his observations down so that those could be passed to other generations all the way to where? What are we reading today in Narrabright? The words of a bloke who wrote them in a palace in the Middle East hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Wisdom is accessed through generations, cross generations, passed from older to younger. It's the same in the New Testament. You open the book of Titus and in Titus 2 you have older men and younger men, older women, younger women. Titus taking the young blokes under his wing and teaching them wisdom. Wisdom is accessed across generations. And if you've got your Bibles there, look over in verse 8. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Don't reject your mother's teaching for there will be a garland of grace on your head and a gold chain around your neck. Do you notice where you gain wisdom there? You gain wisdom in the household, in the family. As a mum and a dad sit down and have a chinwag with their boy and they provide wisdom to their son so that he will know how to navigate the world. That's exactly what we get in the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 1 where Timothy has heard it from his mother and his grandmother and they've sat down and they've read God's word with him. Wisdom is accessed in God's word through living in community, across generations in the community of family. Uh, wisdom is not an individual thing. Wisdom is a relational thing, relational with God, relational with his mob. You can't be an individual and gain wisdom. You need to be in relationship with the Lord and his people so here we are before we get to the last point where we'll try to apply. Uh, what do we need for the year ahead? We need wisdom. We've seen what wisdom is. Wisdom is understanding and explaining the world rightly and then living like it. We've seen that wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is inseparable from the words of the Lord, which helps us know who we are before who God is. That reaches its climax in Jesus, who is God's word in the flesh, and we access this wisdom as it is revealed by God through the ages, across generations, in community, in family. Now, before I go any further, let me tell you there is an alternative. That's a pretty brief alternative. It's very simple, and you might want to take it. It's your decision. Uh, it's there at the end of verse 7. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So there's your alternative. Wisdom. Or foolishness. It's a very clear distinction. Wisdom or foolishness. Foolishness is to navigate the world your way. Foolishness is to navigate the world your way. Without fearing God because you're God. Without the words of God because you have the words of God. And as your own God. And the book of Proverbs tells us very clearly where that leads. Chapter 7, verse 27, foolishness is the road to hell, descending to the chambers of death. What do I need for the year ahead? Point four on the outline. 
Uh, wisdom, uh, what's that going to look like? Uh, what, what will this be applied as? Our first step is to gain wisdom. Uh, the first step begins with the fear of the Lord. Uh, to gain wisdom is to know God rightly and so to know yourself rightly. That will only be through the word of the Lord, through Jesus Christ as he's revealed in God's word, the Bible. To gain wisdom is to know God through Jesus. To gain wisdom is to read and meditate upon God's word as it is revealed most fully in Jesus. To gain wisdom is to read God's word, all of it, as it moves inevitably towards Jesus. Let me be blunt. You cannot be wise without God's word. You cannot be wise without God's word. So please read it. Read it as a whole. Read it with that one thread through it. Read it, pray about it, consider it applied. Open your newsletters and there is a Bible reading plan for the year. There's five different Bible reading plans out there. If you don't like yours, go and talk to someone at morning tea and do a swap. But today is the last day of 2023. Tomorrow morning, there's a Bible reading plan so that you can start gaining wisdom in the next year. All that you need. Uh, once we have gained wisdom, we need to share wisdom. That's why we're listening to Solomon here in Narrabri. That's why we've eavesdropped on a mother and a father and their boy. And that, that sharing of wisdom happens in three communities. It happens in the household or the family as God's word is read in the household as parents, children, siblings. Even if you're on your own in your own household, read the Bible. It happens in the wider church community. One-to-one -one relationships, Bible study groups, intentional catching up over a coffee with each other, reading the Bible and praying together. It happens each week in our church, doesn't it? As we gather around God's word, gather to fellowship with each other and share the wisdom through God's word. Are we actually active in that? Active in all of those three communities. Are, are you active in your home life? Taking the initiative to read the Bible with your spouse or with your housemates or with your children. Children, encourage your parents Grab them. Can we read the Bible today? Are you active in the community of God's mob? In reading God's word in groups, in relationships with each other? Are we active in our church gatherings? Asking and sharing and talking and encouraging through God's word. Gaining, sharing and applying. Wisdom gained, wisdom shared needs to be wisdom applied. Now, what does that look like? I'm going to finish with five very quick examples, very quick, that might get your brain ticking. How does the Lord's Prayer shed light on our daily living and how we explain the food on our table? How does something like Romans 12, 1 to 2, where every moment of our physical existence is described as worship acceptable to God, how does Romans 12, 1 to 2 help us understand our logins? our shopping decisions, our coffee decisions, our book decisions, our time decisions. Every moment acceptable worship to God. Second, how does Psalm 2 shed light on the conflict in Gaza, the horror in the Ukraine, the bedlam in America? How does Psalm 2 give us a depiction of the rulers of the world and the ruler of the universe so we understand the world? How does Genesis 3.17, the ground is cursed because of you, as God judges Adam. How does Genesis 3.17 help us understand natural disasters, roundup, the environment debate, and the way in which our planet works? How does Genesis 6.1-5, where the Bible describes humans as having every inclination of their heart against God, how does Genesis 6.1-5 help us understand our ability to be so lovely and so violent, so glorious and so degraded, so violent at home and so violent on a world stage. How does Genesis 6 help us understand that? How does something like 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I'm the worst, Genesis 1, 26, 28, let us make man in our image, male and female. How do they help us understand interpersonal relationships, grace and kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, repentance, that goes across colour barriers, demographic barriers, 
and age barriers. Just five examples. What do we need for the year ahead? We need wisdom. Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, is inseparable from God's word, and reaches its climax in Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you that it is the revelation of you. And because it reveals you, we come to know who you are and so who we are. Uh, So we're brought to right fear and we're brought to the wisdom that helps us understand the way the world is and how to live in it rightly. Father, please grant us wisdom. Grant us wisdom in community, a community with you and each other. And Father, in that we pray that we will be uh, such a display of your goodness in this town through Jesus Christ that others will come to know you through him alone. In his name we pray. Amen.